The purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. It is no substitute for professional care by your doctor or your qualified health care professional. Never disregard or delay professional medical advice because of something you've heard on this podcast or in any linked material. Guests who speak on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Dr. Shirley neither endorses nor opposes any particular opinion discussed on this podcast. The views expressed on this podcast have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, practice, institution, or other entity with which Dr. Shirley may be affiliated. Welcome to Forever Fab, the podcast on fashion, the art of living, and all things beauty. This podcast is curated by Dr. Shirley Medea, MD, as the definitive source of holistic wellness through beauty. This week's episode is dedicated to the ascent and rising to meet your potential. Trisha Lee is a licensed associate real estate broker with incredible savvy, passion, and drive. An accomplished entrepreneur and a prominent voice within the Brooklyn brokerage and business communities, Trisha Lee is the founder and leader of the highly talented Trisha Lee team at Sirhant. After breaking into the industry with record-breaking numbers, Trisha and her Brooklyn-based team have since done more than $200 million in sales in a little over five years, helping buyers, sellers, and developers achieve their real estate goals throughout the city. Trisha's experiences as a property owner, landlord, and former tenant give her unique insights and perspectives into the entire buying, selling, and renting process. She is a consummate entrepreneur who continues to achieve greatness. Interestingly, before she became a record-breaking realtor, she owned and operated an award-winning chain of nail and beauty bars, Polish Bar Brooklyn, in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, and Prospect Heights neighborhoods of New York City. She keeps giving back to empower her community just as well. Trisha is highly invested in improving and giving back to her community, regularly organizing and running events that support educate, and empower women in real estate and other small businesses. Her event series, Money Matters with Trisha Lee, focuses on financial wellness and features guest speakers and experts. She also leads a Bedford-Stuyvesant Small Business Saturday and a shopping crawl. She has contributed to financial education events such as Chase and Essence Magazine's Currency Conversations and Bank of America and Her Agenda's Financial Workshops. Trisha's altruism extends to her being an active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Welcome, Soror, and the Brooklyn Museum, as well as the Brooklyn Academy of Music. She also sits on the board of advisors for Clinton Hills v. Elms. She joins me today via StreamYard to discuss rising to the top, financial resilience, and economic empowerment for women. Welcome, Trisha. Congratulations on all of your success. And thank you for becoming a beautiful member of the Forever Fab community. How are you? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Thank Thank you for the welcome. (laughs) Thank you so much for your time. So let's get into the meat of things. Yes. What was your childhood like? Uh, My childhood was uh, very, very um, non-traditional. Um, but I was born in New York. I w- lived in uh, Jamaica for a few years with some of my family, um, some of my relatives, my grandparents. And then I moved back to New York to be with my my mom and my dad when I was about four, five years old. Uh, grew up in Phoenix when they separated at a very young age and lived in Phoenix um, well, my entire life. After I left Arizona State, I, I really, really wanted to work in cosmetics and I couldn't, I just didn't feel like I could get ahead. And I wanted to, I think I wanted to be like a a celebrity makeup artist, probably. I think that's what was in my head. Uh, I don't think it was that thought out, though. (laughs) Um, But I I knew that if I got to New York and I started to pursue my passions here, that I could at least, in my mind, I felt like it would be an escalated program to to do what I want to do faster, harder, and better. That's right. So, yeah, I just came with that mindset. Um, When I moved here, I had a part-time job promised to me through my college job, actually, 12 hours a week. And I took it because I felt like, you know, if you take me for 12 hours, you're going to want me for the other 38 for sure, (laughs) you know, or whatever it was. So I I definitely started at 12 hours a week working at Matt Cosmetics when I got here. 
And I had no idea how I was going to live off of 12 hours a week, but I was there for about two weeks and they hired me full time. Of year course in, they I did. Got, I, <laughs> yeah. So that was like a big relief. A year in, I got into management and operations. I spent a long time there at nine for nine years. And that's where I really started to understand how people develop businesses and brands that, ah. um, you know, people love and are feel connected to. That was a huge experience. That was a big time at Mac when I was really kind of coming up and growing up in my world and in my life and watching people just get excited about something that you were putting out there, you know, like, you know, back in the nineties, Mac was like everything. Know, yeah. Yeah. So it was really, it was a really great experience to work for a brand and see how they create that, that feeling that we all had about that brand. That's right. That emotional connection to a brand. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Obviously that has worked well for you, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. But sure. along this journey, I mean, you've obviously moved several different times. So you have experience in finding and creating a home wherever mm -hmm. you are. But when did you re recognize that you wanted to be an entrepreneur, not necessarily in real estate, but when did you get that sort of entrepreneurial bug about, yeah, I, I want to do something for myself? Very young, as young as I could remember. Um, definitely before I was the age of 10. You know, I always wanted to work for myself. I grew up in Arizona with my mom and my sister, and my mom was a single mom. And we experienced childhood in the sense of like almost growing up a lot faster because we had to be more involved with what happens in the home. You know, looking back now, I feel like I credit so many of my characteristics to that experience. But then I also feel like I was kind of robbed of a really normal child. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the healing process is about making, <laughs> making it all make sense. <laughs> <laughs> or trying well, you know, creating a narrative around it that you're good with, right? I know, but I'm like, wait a minute, why, why was I balancing the checkbook at 13, though? That's not necessarily something to brag about. <laughs> but yeah, like my mom, you know, I think what was really happening now, like with the eyes that I can look at it now, my mom was kind of growing up when she was raising us. And, you know, yeah. she had us, she didn't have us young by any means, but she was coming out of the era of the 70s where you walked behind your man and you did what he thought was the best next step, you know? Right, and so. Right. That was what she came out of. And my mom always made it very clear, you know, your dad has the the drive and the vigor and he has the cash, but I'm the one with the brains. Like my mom would always whisper that in my ear. She's yeah. like, he'll be, he'll be broken a year. I'll always be good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I, I think that when she left him and was trying to start her new life, she wanted us to be in a, in a better environment. And I think she wanted us to learn as we were learning. Yeah. So my childhood was very much about my mom learning to adult and learning to run a household and buy a home and furnish a home and fix a home and maintain a home. And we were brought along for that ride. So I, I absolutely have vivid memories of being like 10 and being at Sears looking for a lightweight lawnmower because the yes. girls needed to mow the lawn. And I'm like, why do we have to mow the lawn? Right. <laughs> you know? Those were the things. I mean, growing up, it was like the garbage disposal is broken. We're going to go to the library. We're going to check out a book. And then wow. we're going to all sit here and figure out how to fix this garbage disposal. So that wow. was that was growing up. It was always about being self-sufficient. Yes. It was always about being able to figure things out. Yes. Um, it, it just didn't matter. I, I've watched my mother who you know grew up in New York and never even had a driver's license. I've watched my mother learn how to change an alternator. Oh my God. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, I, I don't those, know how to do that still to this day. I mean, I, yeah, I have regrets that I do, you know, <laughs> but, yeah, we learned how to change flat tires and how to do our own oil changes because you, you weren't supposed to need and depend on anybody. I think that she yeah. was healing herself and becoming extremely independent yes. and she wanted daughters that were just going to be a force. So it, all of the stuff that we had in our heads by the time we were 18 was just so much further than where, I think 18 year olds needed to be, but it's only helped me to propel because I feel like I'm always so much further along in my thinking and my processing about things, you know, well, that is clear, Ms. Trisha. I mean, we, we will see that is clear. <laughs> <laughs> now your makeup is flawless. I don't know if you have makeup oh, on, you. but it is absolutely I do. flawless. And uh, I do. obviously you. you love beauty. You worked at Mac cosmetics. You were just all about it. Now, what led you to open a chain of nail salons? I know it's it's very random, but the whole time I worked at Mac, like I always loved makeup. I always loved beauty. I used to like like in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, third grade. I got kicked out of school for doing makeovers in the bathroom, you know. And I <laughs> not no that not I didn't actually. I always say that that's not accurate. I got kicked out for lying because I said my mom knew I had all of her makeup at school and yeah. she knew that I was doing this. So that's why I got kicked out of school for that day. Got it. Got it. Always was into makeup. I had a routine where I would come home, fully get dressed in my mother's clothes curl my hair and do full face of makeup, look wow. at myself in the mirror, you know, the, that angled mirror that yes. you had, like, yeah, 
Yes. So I get myself from all angles. I, I didn't have a way to take pictures at that time. So I would just get myself from all angles and I wash my face off, put her clothes back and, and do it all over again tomorrow. Just for that was like, like literally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to see myself in shoulder pads and dresses and gold belts and uh, <laughs> e- what is it, uh, isimiyaki or whatever the heck yes. that is, you know, you know, and anais, anais. I just wanted to smell like yes. that, I wanted to look like that. <laughs> it was like, wow! And I would do this all the time and 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 put on her bright blue eyeshadow and I just by the time I got of age to be wearing makeup, I was a pro because I loved it so much, and I had been wearing it, you know, unbeknownst to anyone in my family, every single day, like all through high school, all through grade school, I always wear makeup. I was always getting in trouble wearing makeup. So that made sense. Like yes. way, working in makeup absolutely made sense. Even in college, I was the girl you would come to my you'd come to my apartment if you wanted your hair colored, if you wanted your hair cut. I was in there <laughs> doing blonde bang streaks, burning out everybody's wow. hair. None of my friends have bangs. None of my friends have proper eyebrows. I plucked out everybody's <laughs> eyebrows at 19. Like you, you just see my friends coming down the street. Um, oh but I was always God. just trying to figure it out. I'd go to the mall and I watch the people at Tony and Guy do hair and, 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 and do highlights. And I'd be like, I could do that. Like, yeah, I loved it. And when I worked at Mac, something else was born in me because that was my experience figuring out like, really these people are clamoring for this product. Yeah. And that's intentional. Like that's, that's a thing like that. There's a, that's a job, you know? And so that passion was born there. I think that's when I really fell into marketing and, and I always say I'm still a beauty girl. I love beauty and I can afford beauty in a way that I couldn't before. (laughs) Yes. Yes. But that's where I realized, Oh, that's what I want to do. I want to get people excited about um, some thing. Like that's, that's the it for me. And that's, that's when I figured it out. And honestly, that, tied into nails only because I've bitten my nails since I have been four years old. Oh my gosh, I did too. You know, these these are actually my real nails. I grew these nice. Good, nails. congratulations. You see, yeah. it all grows back. Yes, it's, you know, th- these, uh, this only good thing that came out of COVID for me was <laughs> <laughs> nails. <laughs> I stopped biting my nails finally. But oh. um, yeah, I, I just love nails. And I used to go to the salon, like on my days off, I would always get pedicures, never got manicures because I bit my nails. And I just loved the activity of it. I loved when the girlfriends did it together. And over yes. time, I was like, oh, it'd be awesome to like have a really chic place like this in my own neighborhood in Brooklyn, like where I live. And if I want it, other people must want it. So I just started like bringing up a brand concept of what this business would be. And at the time, it was just very unique. You know, it's not yes. that unique now. I look, like to believe that we set a, a huge trend and we changed yes. what was acceptable for beauty. Um, but it was it was a big thing for the time that it was. And it brought me into kind of just knowing a lot of people in my community, meeting all ah. these amazing women and bosses and homeowners and brand owners and stylists and writers and all these creatives were coming through the doors every day, you know? Yeah. And, and, and then when I had two, they were coming through multiple doors. And yes. that, that was a 10 year experience that really kind of landed me where I'm at now, you know, where I have a really, um, I would say impressive network, <laughs> Yes, uh, you know, and just a real appreciation for working with women and um, building a brand. Like that's really, that's something for me that's huge. That's fantastic. I mean, I, I love your story so much. I, I just want to keep getting into these questions because I want to hear so much more from you. Uh-huh. Now, now you lead one of the most successful real estate teams at Surhand, which is an mm-hmm. uber popular and highly visible real estate firm. Now, what was your strategy to, um, first of all, how did you pivot, right, from mm-hmm. beauty entrepreneurism to real estate. And then once you got to real estate at Sirhant, what was your strategy to sort of outsell everyone else and become team leader? So that's like a two-part question. Yeah. Um, so I think initially when I was in beauty and I had my own business, I was running my salons and I, I found out really quickly that that you really only made money in small business if you own the buildings and you own the location. Like, you you know, you got to, it's, it's ownership. Everything comes back down to ownership. Yeah. So I, I recognize that. And I would, I had the business for 10 years, but five years in, I had already changed gears. I was like, I literally would say all the time, the only people making money around here are the owners. That's it. Yeah. Nobody else, you know, nobody else is making any real money. And, um, and I've never really shied away from talking about money in the way that some people do. Like, you know, like if, if we're talking about my work, I'm talking about my money, you know, yeah. and I don't, I don't try to pretend that that's not what it is. Cause it is yeah. like, that's, yeah. that's what I'm there for. Yeah. Um, I felt like I needed to, to make a change. I didn't see myself honestly growing any further in the beauty world. I didn't mm-hmm. see it happening for me in any different direction. I mean, I'm sure that something else could have happened, but I just wanted to get into, um, 
initially I wanted to get into selling real estate. I felt that I would be naturally good at it. I thought I'd make great money really quickly and I could come up with a beauty brand. I did not expect to like fall into it and get obsessed with it and um, it just be my new passion. That wasn't an, an expectation. I was like, I'll do this for two years, make some cash and start something else. It's yeah. like, no, that's not what happened. Now you that's not have it. to- you, now you have to avoid me if you don't want to talk about real estate. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go over there because I'm going right. to be talking about real estate over here. <laughs> that's right, because that's what you do. That's yeah, you do. yeah, yeah. So the pivot came natural because it was just like, oh, this is this is lucrative, but it's also um, really fun and it's really yes. empowering. And, you know, because of the beauty business, the core client base was my beauty clients. So therefore, yes. most of my clients were women. And there is a little thing, there's something different about putting women in homes and helping women mm-hmm. buy their first homes and working with women in that space of finance and ownership. Mm-hmm. It's extremely empowering. Um, they always say I inspire them, but I, they inspire mm-hmm. me more than I inspire them. You know what I mean? Like they're yeah. just, there's some really amazing dynamic women in my network and in this community. And it's, I'm, I think I'm always trying to figure out ways like you need to meet so-and-so like, you know, you need yes. to, you should know whatever. So I do, I do dinners often to kind of connect power players because mm-hmm. there's just all these people out here that have all these super duper talents and they're so crazy. And I feel like I'm a great connector in that way. Cause I get to meet them and it's like, you know, the space of working on their, their sale, but you get to know someone really well. Yes. Um, and even though I might've met you 10 or 12 years ago, I really get to know them in the process of helping them sell their house or helping them buy a house more so than I ever did in the salon. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm I'm going to create a new hashtag for you. It's just going to be called hashtag born fabulous. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> now you, don't be mad when you see it. Me, okay, I'm every not day. Gonna, you can have it. It's all yours. It's all yours. Free. <laughs> free, 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 free. <laughs> now, Dr. Shirley said no, so, so you know it's true. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now you and your colleagues invest mm-hmm. a lot of you invest in a lot of marketing through TV, through social, and you know through your networking dinners. So many different things. Now, how has this strategy been an absolute game changer for you? And do you think like in these days, people just, if they want to be successful, they just have to do so at least social, if not TV. You know, that's, that's complicated. It depends on who, to me, I think it depends on your demographic. Like you Mm -hmm. have to find out where your clients are. Um, My clients are on social. My clients are actually uniquely more heavily on Facebook than anywhere else. Like Mm -hmm. Facebook and and LinkedIn, I do really well. Yes. Um, But I do market everywhere and I do the same. I, I, you know, I, I believe one thing about marketing. You don't need to know what works. Just do it all. You know, like just, (laughs) just, just be doing it. Like just keep doing it. Like, you know, and you just don't know because at the end of the day, what is marketing? It's just becoming top of mind. And so I don't care if you pass me at a bus stop and then you see a pre-rolled ad on YouTube and then I show up in your Instagram feed and then my Facebook posts you you can relate to because you, you know, you like my earrings or whatever. I don't care how you see me. I just want you to think of real estate and then think, to think of Trisha Lee. That's the goal. Yes. And so I try to take it that light when it comes to marketing. What I think Sirhan has in it, that's very unique. And anyone that knows the brand would say this is they focus really heavily on the personalities behind the brand yes. and they use media to kind of put us in, in the front. So it's a good fit for yes. you. If, if, if it's a good fit for you, you know right. what I mean? Like right. I, if I can connect with people and they get to know who I am and how I am, that helps my business. There that's are people right. that maybe that wouldn't be the case, you know, maybe you're better off in a, in a still photo and a, and a post. I, I don't know, but I think yeah. I do well one-to-one with individuals um, because I have such a very, uh, just a story, just a weird background. Like I grew up in Arizona, you know, I'm now, I live in Brooklyn. Like I, you know, it's just, it's a lot. So there's just very few people in the world that I can't relate to in one way or another. I've seen it all. I love that too, that there are few, very few people in the world that you can't relate to because at the end of the day, right, we're all human. And if we can sort of figure out what motivates us or how, you know, how those different touch points, then how can you not relate to various people, right? Absolutely. We all like, I, I believe we all want the same things. I could talk to any stranger. I know I've always been able to. Um, and I think that uh, what, what's important about the real estate piece and the media piece is that I feel that people select you because they like you. And, 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 and that's a great way to work with people and to meet yeah. people, you know, yeah. um, most people that call me are like, I've been watching you for a while and I think mm. you're the person, you know? Oh, wow. That's yeah. amazing. And that's and yeah. on the yeah, another side of it, I just try to to show and share who I really am as much yes. as possible, you know. Right. right, it's not worth it to be inauthentic, right? No, and I think that if there are things about me, because I have very strong personality points, that that turns you off, it's probably for the best because yes. it probably is not a good fit for me either. 
you know, and, and I'm more concerned about a good fit for me than I'm about a good fit for you. <laughs> <laughs> just that I'm just saying. <laughs> and you should have the same attitude. <laughs> That's right. Now, and, and I do believe the same way. I say that about my practice all the time. I'm not for everyone. And that's okay. That's actually, yeah. a, a, you know, a blessing because it saves yeah. both of us on either end, you know, a of lot course. of, a lot of drama. Now, did you experience any challenges as a woman and a woman of color in business or real estate or both? Absolutely. Always, you know, yeah. every day and, and, every, you know, what's funny is I did, um, I was talking to my partner one day about like, I think it'd be interesting to get this perspectives of all of the black agents here at Sirhan because mm -hmm. it is a luxury brand. It's a high skill brand. And it's a brand that all eyes are on. And yes. so we already have that layer. And then it's added with the brand that we are affiliated with. Decided to do the video. They, they like the company loved it. They, they like, they like fast tracked it all the way. I think I may have said it on Thursday. We were filming by Monday. Like it wow. was just like, I don't know what else was on the, on the schedule, but they made it a priority. They cleared it. Yeah. <laughs> we started the project and it was the in most interesting thing because it was just like, you know, what are some of the challenges? When I tell you not a dry eye in the oh, room. Oh, my gosh. Because it's like it's not you don't get to ever just release that. You don't ever it's get true. to really just be like, oh, girl. It's so I, true, you know what I mean? Trisha. Absolutely. Yes. It's just like, oh, hold this for a minute. Hold this for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Hold this for a minute, which becomes, yeah. you know, a month, which becomes a year, which becomes a decade. If not Absolutely. More. I mean, I'm my right last there six with you. Yeah. My last six months I've been working with my partner. Um you know, a straight black male. Yeah. And so he's listening to all of my experiences for years, you know, and yes. um, we both work in real estate. We've, we've never worked together though. Right. And he has two very powerful, very, very extremely successful, professional, successful sisters. Mm -hmm. And so he he hears it from every different direction. Wow. But now he's witnessing it because we're working together. Oh and now he's witnessing the difference in tone, the difference in tolerance, just yeah. how people manage me and working with me versus even for him. You know, wow. and it's one thing that for me to come home and say it, it's another yes. thing to observe it, you know? Yes. Um, so that's been enlightening to have someone who truly is the most optimistic person I know say that's to wonderful. me, no, no, you know what? You're right. And that is some, that is some nonsense. Yeah. And no, he wouldn't have said that to me or he wouldn't have said that to me that way. That's right. Um, yeah. So it, it's interesting, but my, my power in that is, is, and I think that's how I ended up at Sirhant is I feel like I want to be somewhere where if I walk into this room boldly and say, you're going to hear me out. My ideas are good. And yeah. if I'm here, you're better for it. Yeah. You know? Because I have great ideas and I have great, I have a great work ethic and, and I'm fast and I'm smart and I'm always looking for better ways to do things. I have all these different right. things I'm here and I'm contributing and you're going to take this and you're going to take it boldly. And I felt like at Sirhant, I didn't have to diminish that in any way. You yeah, know, I just congrats. didn't. I mean, my first time meeting with Ryan, I was like, I'm looking for somebody to be the little Wayne to my Drake. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I, I know he was like, I know he was like, what? And I was like, well, you know, like, little, little Wayne is huge. You know, he's huge. He's huge. But he can also produce someone like Drake for all of us to love and enjoy. That's without right. Without that he's less huge because, That's you know, right. he's produced Drake. I'm like, you know what I'm saying? Like a little, yes. you know, usher energy to my, like, maybe I could be That's Justin right. Bieber. And he's like, so you're, you're, you're Drake. I'm like, I'm Drake. I'm like, and I'm Lil yeah. Wayne. I was like, you would be Lil Wayne. He's like, okay, yeah. all right, clear. And I was like, okay, just let's start. We're going to start this conversation. Let's start it right. Right. Well, kudos to him for not being um, threatened by that because that's not an easy position, A, to understand and B, to accept. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I give him a lot of credit and I give you a lot of credit for just putting it that way. So, it, you know, it's sort of, you know, there was a little bit of humor, there was a little culture joke in there. And, and yeah. there was the reality of, yeah, I have this work ethic and you will benefit from it. Yeah. And I feel that, um, I don't know. I feel like when I say like, and I say this, like, I say this everywhere. I'm like, I, I'm that black girl and I show up bold and black. Yep. And I I, I don't, I've never had a conversation with him about it, but I feel him standing behind me. Like you, what she said, what she said, <laughs> that, that's the energy yeah, I like get that. from it. Yeah. Yeah. Just like she said. And you know what? I've worked a long time. I'm in my forties. I've worked hard for everyone I've ever worked for. And I've worked even harder for myself and to yes. be in a position where you feel like I just feel free. Oh and when God. you feel free, you're able to create the best work that you've ever created. That right. Is, yes. I agree. But that's like, what that experience has been for me. You know, it, it's been so well deserved and so much appreciated. I'm writing that down. When you feel free, that's when you can create your best work ever. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's a, that's a big quote. Now, speaking of your best work and um, success, you host a workshop called Money 
matters with Trisha yes. Lee. Now, yes. what is the intention of this series? And frankly, how does one sign up for it? Well, the, well, how they sign up for it is a little tricky. We're going to have it at <laughs> Surhant this spring, and we're trying to figure out the logistics of it because our space is more like a social club. Um, but <laughs> that's nice. Uh, yes. When I announce it, though, people typically sign up right away. They RSVP. It books out very quickly. The purpose of it was essentially to put all of my great women in the room together mm -hmm. and to share them with my clients. Yes. So my best friend is a very successful real estate developer and she's a real estate lawyer and she's always done that when I was in beauty. Yes. And so then I go into real estate and she relocates to Miami and no longer does anything in New York. So it was perfect timing. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, what a lot of what I, I saw happening in real estate, I saw through the lens of a black woman that was my age building luxury waterfront properties. Wow. Then coming then coming to New York and, you know, converting two family townhouses to condos. So that's mm -hmm. my lens, right? And yes. that's what I've seen and that's what I think is realistic. So that's my first problem is my <laughs> I'm inspired by I'm inspired by someone like that. You know, like that's yes. what I'm seeing every day. That's who I'm vacationing with, you know, sleep sleepovers at her house. We're more like sisters than we are friends. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. So that is a big part of my inspiration. And then I think, you know, just Figuring out how to build the business in in real estate was so much more about money training. Ah. So I thought, okay, well, if I start bringing in like someone like my friend Debbie who can tell you about you know development, if I bring in my accountant who can talk to you about you know bookkeeping as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. or you know I bring in my insurance agent and let's talk about ageism because a lot of my friends are bloggers and creatives. And what does that look like when you're 62? You know, right. how do we plan? How do we plan at 38? for this really, all these unique careers and lifestyles that we've manifested and created, maybe just didn't budget for. Right. <laughs> right. And I'm speaking, I'm speaking about myself because yes. as an entrepreneur, I felt like I lost 10 years of stacking and saving and building, yes. you know, yes. in exchange for having my own business. I don't think that that's mm -hmm. unique. I think, unfortunately, that that may be the um, story for a lot of Black women and, and women of color, BIPOC, you know, um, communities as well, because it isn't necessarily something that we were, that we grew up with. It isn't something necessarily that we were taught. So, yeah. right. But there's always an opportunity to learn as you're doing with your workshops. Absolutely. So I really just bring around the people that I trust to sit in conversation with me in front of a group of people. And yeah. so to make it more interactive, we do really great worksheets. We give um, great examples. We talk about funny stories. It's very, very open. It's very honest. And then we end the, the, we end the evening by just making better financial commitments to ourselves. Yeah. But it's the most inspiring work and the most motivational work I've ever done. I don't have something else that I do professionally that makes me feel as good as these events. And so I'm really excited to be rolling out another one. I'm thinking we're probably going to do it in the month of May, right after Mother's Day. Uh, we're still working out timing on that. But it's, you know, it's an event that I, I pr primarily contribute to because I want to be able to offer this to my community. Because it, as my business has shifted, I've gotten more into the luxury space. So I don't really mm -hmm. necessarily work directly with my community all the time or as much yes. as I used to. Yes. Um, so there has to be a sense of giving back in a way with this business for it to make sense in my head. So that's something that I feel that I can take. It's tangible and I can contribute to my own community and say, well, I don't know that I'm fixing the problem, but I'm definitely not making it worse. <laughs> you know, like I'm definitely creating a space for people to get the tools for what they need. And these are yes. the same people that have given me direction. Like I, I always tell people I'm sharing as I learn. I'm not teaching. I'm right. literally just sharing as I learn, you know? Well, I, um, like to and say, I think it's so important. Yes, I agree. But I, I, um, I like to say giving back is the new luxury. So clearly you exemplify that because you are passionate about contributing to your community. You've been listening to part one of the Forever Fab podcast with my guest, Trisha Lee. Stay tuned for part two. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Forever Fab, the podcast on fashion, the art of living, and all things beauty, curated by Dr. Shirley Madir, MD. Live beautifully and help make the world a more beautiful place.